Hands up, leg, knife, stone to stone your children. Don't put pepper in your private parts. Send them to school. If you have a helper in your house, that is everything of your children. Don't treat her bad. Take her the way you take your children. Please, we are begging you. Stop raping girls in Nigeria. Please, we are begging. Stop violence in Nigeria. If you can cry, please, we beg of you. If you have a husband that is to beat you, please, we have nobody you are going to call here. We are here for you. You come to us on behalf of sure girls you are saying. Hello, welcome to another episode of The Heart of the Matter. My name is Umilola Oshikoya and our topic for today is the invisible disability. Our guest today is Vita Chadwick, who is a social blogger. She's also a human rights activist or advocate and she focuses on empowering women she calls sheroes in the Ajigile community. She has been recognized by organizations such as Leap Africa. Vita, thank you very much for coming to The Heart of the Matter. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. What is an invisible disability? Well, it's disabilities that are not as visible as those that you would see um, because they, they are not just there, but it doesn't make them any less um, disempowering and disenabling. So what, what, can you give us some examples? For example, I live with an in invisible disability okay. in the sense that I, I may not use um, walking aids or crutches but it's I have a disability that affects me and how I'm able to interact with a built up environment. Okay. Do you want do you want to give a specific example just in case because there's some viewers out there that may benefit from this. Yeah. You know I asked you this earlier, you how many minutes do you have for me? <laughs> but I'm going to try and summarize the story. Back in two thousand and four I was misdiagnosed and I had four surgeries based on that misdiagnosis. You know, one of the consequences of the surgeries is difficulty breathing and my voice. So that is why I have this husky voice. I'm not trying to, <laughs> you know. So, yes, that is um, one of the consequences. And because it is something that I, ha I have to live with, it's not really an ailment. But it is disenabling in the sense that I cannot run up three flights of stairs like you would. You know, so that is just an example of what an invisible disability is. Okay, and is this what motivated you to set up and to focus on empowering women? It is one of the reasons, but it has grown out of that. At first, I I drew upon the my experiences as a woman who has had to live with a disability. Um, I felt like I was not prepared for what I could face. I would face in the world. So I drew upon that, but as I grew in my vocation, it became more about the stories of the girl who is sexually molested every time she goes to sell for a mother, or the woman who cannot live an abusive marriage or relationship because she does not have money. So it, yes, it's why I do what I do, but it has become more about, you know, why the world is the way it is. Mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges that these disadvantaged women face in the rural communities? And do they differ from the urban or the city? I wouldn't say they are different because we are all humans and we have similar, um, very similar problems and even victories. But I would say that because they are poor, many of them are poor, they are not educated and makes it even worse. So, for example, the woman who lives in an urban area may have money, but she may not have education in terms of information about her rights as a person. Yeah. It becomes just one issue. But if she's not informed, which means she doesn't have education and she doesn't have money, it becomes two. So that is one of the challenges we face with women in rural settlements. Mm. And you're focused on Ajigone in particular? Or that is, it is just one Ajigone? of the communities okay. that I work in. Okay. And that, was, that is really where the project grew out from. Okay. So I started in Ajigone, but it has... Where, what other communities do you... Like we work in one community in Calabar. Okay. We also work in Badagri, 
just if you are going towards the point of no return. Yeah. Okay. Um, how has the Nigerian society fed the beast of women disenfranchisement? How, how have we enabled this thing to keep growing? That is a difficult question to answer and it's not about being politically correct. It is because in truth a lot of us don't know what it means to be disenfranchised. Even some men do not know what it means to be abusive financially, psychologically, but they perpetrate this attitude. So yes, I think information, not just to women, but to everybody, would go a long way. And how have we fed this beast? Is by deliberately not educating ourselves about these things and looking at the potential of a woman who is empowered, what she could possibly bring to the development of our country. So what does EWOF stand for? Empowering Women of the Future. Mm -hmm. It's one of the projects of ASHA Initiative and it focuses on girls and women. Mm -hmm. We try to educate them with education and economic empowerment because we found that, that just getting people to sponsor girls to school is not enough to keep them in school. If the mother is poor, very poor, she would prefer her child to go and hawk than access the free schools that are there. So how do you change that mindset? Clearly there's a mindset issue here. Yes. Also there's, a, there's an issue of poverty. So it's not just the mindset, it is how do you empower them to enable their daughters to stay in school. So that is why we teach them soft skills. We give them small grants to start small businesses so that they have other sources of income other than sending their daughters to work. Mm. Are these women willing to receive help? Is there fear or do they also suffer stigmatization? They do. There's always the fear of the unknown. But the majority of them really do not want their children being hurt. Mm. It is innate to want to protect your child. So for the most of them, they are very willing to embrace help and they are taking in this knowledge and uh, building businesses. So you're going into these communities that sometimes you probably are going there for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, have you faced any attacks or backlash from the communities? A lot, especially when it concerns sexual violence. Um, the community tends to want to cover its shame, especially the families. They say, hey, it's not your problem. Mind your business. You're an outsider. At least that is one of the times where I have been treated as an out outsider or members of my organization have been treated as an outsider because they want to, you know, cover the shame and not want... Yeah, there's a yeah. silence culture. Exactly, mm. the culture of silence. So what about the women? Have you faced any backlash from them? As a matter of fact, a lot of women are reluctant to leave abusive relationships or even speak out because they are stigmatized in churches and mosques and the market. It is all about protecting the family name and that culture of silence. Mm. So, so you so rather suffer in silence. Exactly. Mm. So sometimes it becomes very personal. They say, hey, you are a single girl. Now you are trying to... Mm. You I, want I, to make me like you. Exactly. Mm. But that, that, is not, that is not the point. And I understand that that is just a way to deflect from the pain and mm. what society has tossed at us, not them. Wow. Um, we need to quick, take a quick break. So okay. we'll, please hold that thought. We'll continue this after the break. That's fine. Thank you. Viewers, stay tuned. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to the heart of the matter. 
We still have with us Bitter Chadwick, and we're still talking about some of the challenges women face in rural communities. Bitter, you know, we're talking about um, the silence culture. Um, what are some of the things we can do to stop this from continuing? Because people need to speak up. People need to speak up when they are ready to speak up. So we, we need to support victims and survivors of abuse of any form to speak up when they decide to. Plus, when they do speak up, we must not um, stigmatize them, judge them based on those, um, those experiences that they've had. Plus, the rape culture, which perpetuates the belief that women are always at fault, it is what you wear, the way you talk, or your friends that makes you a victim, it needs to stop too. What are some of the psychological repercussions to these victims? Of? The victims of rape, assault, some of the women that you talk to, what are some of the psychological? Sometimes it has more far reaching than even they can understand. Like research has shown that in the long run they have, when they go into a relationship they have, they may have dysfunctional relationships, marriages, and sometimes they don't even know what fits this dysfunction. Sometimes they may be, they may not be willing to go into relationships at all because of that traumatizing experience, mm. especially if they haven't had a closure. Can you share with us an example of one of the cases that you have dealt with? I'm going to share with you a story, and it's I'm sharing this because I, I was given permission to share it, though anonymously. It is a girl who was raped by an older man when she was 11. And after it happened, the family says, you know what, this man has, you know, robbed you of your virginity. He has to marry you. Wow. Yes. So this girl had to be married to her to rapist just because her honor had been stolen away from her by this man. So that she had to live with until she was about 21. And eventually she oh, said, yes. you know, she left the marriage, the Fox marriage, and she decided to do something with her life. Though she had kids, she kept all that within her. You know, when I met her, when I spoke with her, she shared the story with me. And it is, now what is beautiful about it is she has so much pain and betrayal from her parents, her community. But it is what she decided to do with it. Right now she's sharing her stories. She's giving me permission to share her stories with girls who are experiencing similar challenges. And she's working towards putting an end to this. Wow, that, that is a, a very inspiring story. Um, <clears throat> the question I was going to ask is why would the community allow one of their own to marry an abuser, a rapist? Is it a function of lack of education, information? What, what could it be? A mixture of those plus culture. You know, we, though it's fading off, but a lot of people still hold women to their virginity. And when that is taken away, a woman is often portrayed as less of whom God has created her to be. Now for a community, for a family that holds that so dear, it's going to be difficult to get that woman to get married to a man who is, whom they think is right for her. So it is a thing of shame. They, they do not even want to hear about anything else. They want to quickly cover that shame. So it's a mixture of everything, culture, misinformation, Religion. Yes. Religion. Yeah. Can, you, can you share more light on Well, that? I don't want to go into religion right now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big topic, but yes, religion, I think it plays a big role too. Mm. Because in, some people say, well, I will talk a little bit on that. If you're married to someone, you have to keep your marriage, you have to stay in the marriage, whether you're abused or not. I think that's probably what you were trying Except, to say. Exactly. And so people often misinterpret religious texts. They lift out what suits them and suits the situation and just
capitalize on those. Mm -hmm. What are some? So, how does your organization solve this problem? What are the, some of the things that you do, both to the women, to help the women, and also the community to change their perception and their mindsets? Can you please talk on that? We do focus group discussions. We help victims and survivors to heal alongside each other. One way we do that is by getting daughters and mothers to sit together. For example, the mother who doesn't know the effects of abuses, she knows, well, okay, so, but she really doesn't know yeah, the... She hasn't experienced it. Exactly. So she, so she perpetuates that culture. But these daughters, they are yeah, a whole new breed of daughters. They no longer belong to that era where everything goes. They begin to know. They feel the pain. They feel the shame. So getting them, trying to re reconcile that generation gap of information and emotion, it really works wonders. Something else we do is outreaches in the community. And in doing that, we partner with religious houses, um, the traditional role of each of the communities, thankfully we found them very supportive and we partner with local schools too. So in terms of stakeholders now, what is the role of the church, family leaders, community leaders in ensuring that these women are treated differently, treated the way they're supposed to be treated? I must say that religion specifically has done a lot towards women empowerment, enabling women to be independent, to be assertive, to even have positions within the church, and not just the church, it, with religion in general. But I think that religion can use its position of authority to do more in terms of promoting the rights of women and girls not just helping the women now but targeting the men as well because women do not live in isolation mm -hmm. women live with boyfriends husbands fathers brothers friends so it needs to diversify its approach mm -hmm. so that the whole environment and the community itself is enabling to foster development and growth so, is it, would you say that a lot of awareness, the church needs to be informed about some of these issues and the role that it can play in solving these issues? I would say that in some circumstances, and I would also say that most churches are informed, but they need to act more on it. They, they have to take it seriously. Yes, take it more seriously, because these things happen every other day. And there is no scripture that says we should suffer in pain and silence. So we need to take it more seriously. So how do you fund all of this? Goodwill from people, most importantly. But I think our work and our choices reflect whom we are personally. And at Asha, we are all about helping individuals grow. So that is why we try to also generate our own income instead of going cap in hand begging for funds and donations. So we have a lot of social entrepreneurship mm -hmm. um, initiatives okay. to help us fund our projects. Can you tell us some of these um, initiatives? For example, we have the Asha Shiro's Academy, which is a vocational skills acquisition center okay. where girls and women are trained to make bags, shoes, um, purses, um, jewelries. Mm -hmm. So we sell those at sometimes a high price, but because of the work we do, people patronize us. Mm -hmm. So we reinvest the profit mm -hmm. into our community work. Mm -hmm. Then another one is um, one of our initiatives we are launching this year, Empowering Laughter. It's sort of a non-profit and profit collaboration in the sense that um, comedians and musical artists who you'd ordinarily pay millions to mm. have their services have agreed to come perform for less than nothing but we are going to sell tickets for the event so people can 
support her work, but also get a value, mm. a very good value for the money. Mm. I love it. I love the fact that because, you know, you're not just sitting down and waiting for money to come. Yeah. You're being innovative and you're thinking. And it reminds me of, um, I don't know if you've heard of the, the, the pair of shoes called Tom's. Mm -hmm. The founder of Tom's, um, I remember reading his, uh, his book, The Biography, and how they wanted to help children in Argentina who didn't have shoes to wear. So obviously they would have the option of just going to people to get people to give them money. But sometimes it's, that is actually very difficult to get people to give money. Sometimes they have to see the value. And so what they were doing was um, he decided to now make shoes and started selling these shoes in all the high streets and high profile stores in places like the UK, the US and the proceeds from these shoes is what he uses to fund the shoes for the less privileged so basically the tagline is if you buy one pair of shoes you're also giving a child the opportunity to wear a pair of shoes and they've also moved to eyewear and they've really grown and I mean loads of massive companies in the US have partnered with them, like companies like AT&T, because of what they're doing. And so hearing you, you know, say that, you know, you've, you've come up with these innovative ideas of raising funds, it's very noble and I must applaud you for that. Um, equally important is that it encourages people to be self-sufficient. Yes. Mm. I mean, I work with women and I tell them, I try to help them to be independent. I'll, it would be a contradiction if I start going cap in hand begging for money. Meanwhile, I'm telling these women that you need to be able to build on what you have so that mm. somebody can pay for your services. Mm. So I think it's, it's a win-win situation. Mm. But if people, someone may be watching who would like to donate, they, they're free to... Yes, to they, are free, they are free. And please, when you buy this ticket, you are not buying it just to watch these people perform. You are buying it because you are passionate about helping women and girls. And a lot of, before you ask me this question, a lot of people ask me, why women and girls? <laughs> why not men? And I tell them, you need to specialize. For example, if I have a brain problem, I will not go to a general practitioner. I'll go to a doctor who specializes in brain surgery. I think specializing is how we get the best out of whatever we are doing. Mm. And also, like I have said earlier, women do not live in isolation. So by empowering women, they empower their families, their communities, their families, and I have searched myself and I have seen that my strength and my passion lies most with helping women and girls. Mm. Well, thank you very much for coming on the program. It's been an honor to speak to you today. Um, you're a shiro. You're um, <laughs> exactly you're a shiro. It's inspiring to see what you're doing and helping all these women. And you may not know the impact you're you're um, having on these lives, but I just know that there's so many people that have benefited from what you're doing. So I'm just saying that to encourage you to keep going and the Lord will keep helping you and he'll send favor your way. Thank Amen. You. Thank you for having me. Thank it's you so pleasure. much. Um, viewers, we hope you um, have learned a lot and have been inspired by this episode. If you'd like to contact VETA or you'd like to be part of the EWOF or ASHA program, um, her details are on the screen please reach out to her or you can reach out to us on the Heart of the Matter and we will direct you. Um, thank you very much for watching. Until next week, stay blessed.